Peace and respect to you all. Welcome to a debate on uh, on the with the hosting of me, a very unprofessional debate hoster. But we have uh, two friends of mine that I appreciate greatly. Tonight we have Jefferson Spatchcock and Gavin Herleman debating uh, the authorship of First Timothy. Um, let's keep in mind as we go through this that um, Gavin is uh, it's got an electrical delay of about three seconds. That's how far away he is being that he is in New Zealand. Uh, so he's got that three second delay. So please give him a little bit of forgiveness. Um, if it seems like he's being rude, it's not necessarily that he's being rude, but just can't time it perfectly. Whereas Jefferson and I are really close together. And it, it seems like that's a consensus of what what Gavin should be doing, but not necessarily. Uh, into debate today's debate, we're going to do very very standard stuff. We're going to have a ten minute opening, five minute rebuttals. Uh, the second person uh, giving an opening will not be rebutting uh, what is said in the other person's opening whatsoever, but making their own opening statement. Gentlemen, introduce yourselves, please and give a little bit of what you're doing uh, in your life and your channels. Jefferson, would you start? Hi, everybody. Jefferson Spatchcock. Um, just kind of I'm still starting to kind of get into the YouTube community. Don't really have a lot of followers. Mostly do stuff on atheism and biblical scholarship. And I like uh, uh, interviewing um, different people that have been around the YouTube great debate community. Go ahead, Brother Gavin. Hi everybody, Shalom Sabat, my name is Gavin, I'm down here all the way in New Zealand hanging on for dear life if we're on a flat earth, um, otherwise I'm really looking forward to this opportunity to um, maybe shed a bit more light and a bit of reflection of God on, on those who are either fence sitting or, or not believing. Thanks uh, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. OK, guys, so we're going to start into um, our 10 minute openings. And since the, there's a positive statement that Paul did write first Timothy and Gavin has adopted that position as a theist, uh, he will be opening first. Gavin, whenever you're ready, the clock begins. OK. And. I shall start. The force of the external historical evidence is all in favor of the traditional view concerning the authorship of, authorship of First Timothy. The witnesses of the early church to their place in the New Testament canon and their poor lean authorship is as clear, full, and unhesitating as that given to any other epistles. Even those who reject the Pauline authorship must admit there is much in their contents that is characteristically Pauline. Paul is the author of this letter. Most most translations most most translations show this by beginning the letter um, with the words from Paul. Paul identified himself as the author of First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus. Um, the attack from the skeptics has been directed along chronological, ecclesiastical, doctrinal, and linguistic lines. Um, the conservative position which I hold continues to hold the, the favour of most able scholars and is again receiving wide support in critical circles. I don't see any compelling reason to abandon the tra tra traditional view that these epistles are the genuine products of Paul's old age. Um, and just to quote uh, Joseph John Gurney in his uh, famous book, A Letter to a Friend, the, the, the second century never spoke as these epistles speak. So now we've got to get down to the weeds or the exegesis of the book. So um, a, word, a word is in order um, as a preference here. Uh, Martin Debelis and Hans Konzelman insist that the burden of proof is on those who, who hold for Pauline authorship of the epistles. It matters not to them that the claim is made within, within, the pastorals that Paul is the author. They and many other skeptics are far too secure in their arguments and far too presumptuous. Debelis and Konzelman, for example, note passages in the pastorals that are much like those in the Pauline letters that they accept, but rather than accept this as an indication of Pauline authorship of the pastorals, they dismiss them as works of, of an excellent imitation of a pseudo anonymous writer. 
Uh, formerly, such passages were, were regarded as fragments lifted from genuine and otherwise unknown Pauline letters. Um, when an argument runs in circles like this, you've got to wonder how strong the case truly is. Now, there's a few theological issues that the skeptics will object to, and I'll just run over them uh, now and debunk them. Um, first is uh, confusion over definition of the law, and this is cited in regard to First Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Um, we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law is not made for righteous, for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for adulterers and perverts, for slave traders, liars and perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine. Hans Hansen, in his work on page three, says that, uh, whereas in Galatians and Roman, Romans the law is a power hostile to man, here it simply condemns evil do, evildoers. Um, e. F. Scott in the in the pastoral pastoral epistles similarly claims that the pastoral writer, obviously Paul, has confused the Mosaic law in general and and thinks of it merely as a necessary check in evil doing. Scott also adds with his reverence for the Jewish law could never have said that it was not intended for righteous men. In reply to these authors, um, uh, check uh, Basler Bass, page 41 in his work. So from that, we can say that the views about the law are complementary and compatible, not con contradictory. We don't see a great deal of force in these objections. It seems that Paul could easily conceive of the law as both hostile to man and as a check on evil doing, as, as indeed I, I would hold to that position. I, I fail to see any reason why Paul's reverence for the law contradicts the idea that it was not intended for righteous men, because at any rate, according to Romans 3, there are no righteous men. This is conceptually much the same as saying that when Jesus said that he had come to call not the righteous but sinners, he was denigrating his own mission. And uh, you can look at that in uh, Marshall Mars, page uh, 70, page 375 of his book, A Critical and Exegetical, Exegetical, Exegetical Commentary on the Pastoral Epistles. This verse may yeah. indicate Luke. Sorry, sorry, Richard. That's half of the time. Okay. This verse may indicate Luke in reference. Um, Stephen G. Wilson uh, on page 90 points out that the word here for teachers of the law, the Greek word is nomodikaskaloi, appears in the New Testament, Testament only in two other places, Luke and Acts, we may perhaps see here a shadow of Lucan influence. In, in context, Paul is addressing a heresy that misuses Jewish beliefs. In verse 7, Paul refers to the heretics thusly. They want to be teachers of, teachers of the law, but they do not know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. Obviously, here, the heretics were making improper use of the law, and Paul was simply emphatically opposing the futilities um, of much Pentateuchal speculation, um, hence the seemingly lack of reverence for the law. In addition, Marshall Mars on uh, page 376 of his work points out that when addressing a Hellenistic audience, Paul's response will be unlike that made to Ju Judaizers, Judaizers in Galatians and Romans, where a positive view of the law could easily be mis misinterpreted. Um, there's uh, skeptics will, will raise the ob objection about the confusion of a faith, personal or loyalty to, to a church tradition. Throughout the pastorals, Paul refers to the faith in the sense of a creed or tradition, which is said to contradict Paul's usual way of referring to faith only in a personal way. Uh, you can find that um, page six, William Barclay's work, Letters to Timothy. However, Paul refer, refers to the faith in a creedal way. In other places, Rome, Romans 4, 12, 4, 16, 1 Corinthians 16, 13, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Galatians 1, 23, chapter 3, 23, chapter 6, verse 10, 
Philippians chapter 1, 25, 27, Colossians chapter 2, 7. It was therefore not a foreign usage to him. He simply uses it that way more often in the pastorals, as we would expect if he were writing to church leaders whose job it was to safeguard creeds and traditions. And considering that he was near the end of his life, this would not be a bad idea, according to Philip Town, uh, page 312 of his work. The pastorals, here's another objection. The pastoral, the pastoral, pastoral lack the Pauline mysticism, whatever that means. One can only ask why skeptics expect personal letters to contain mysticism. Why would they expect Paul to always be the same way every time he writes a letter? May we also ask why Paul has to get mystical about in these letters. Um, another objection is... Would you please uh, pause? Gavin, there's something amiss with your microphone. You sound like you're in a barrel now, and we're going to start your time uh, with the two minutes remaining since I've interrupted you. If you changed something, would you please change uh, it back? I, ha I haven't touched Maybe the thing. Distance. I haven't touched the thing. It's better now. Please continue. Okay. You have two minutes. Another objection for skeptics is that it, that uh, First Timothy is contradictory to Acts. Some critics object that the pastorals cannot fit into the chronology chrono, chronology chrono, chronology of Acts, which is rather ironic, since many of the same critics do, don't even regard Acts as reliable or accurate in the first place. At any rate, the standard answer here is that these letters were written well after the time given in Acts. Um, as a reference, read Acts chapter 20, verses 25 through to 38. I won't read that because I don't have time. Um, another objection is there's no proof of such a journey to the east or of Paul's release from prison. Um, and this comes from Werner G. Uh, Kimmel, as he argues in his book, An Introduction to the New Testament. But actually, there is evidence of this. What do you know? An expectation of release is found in Acts and in the prison epistles. Festus, Acts 20, chapter 26, 30, and Agrippa indicate that Paul was guilty of no wrongdoing. Paul shows confidence in his imminent release in the prison epistles. That's in Philippians chapter 1, verse 25, chapter 2, verse 24, and Philemon, verse 22. First Clement 5, 6 to 7 indicates Paul, that Paul was released. The letter contains these lines. Paul preached in the east and the west and won notable renown for his faith. He taught righteousness to the whole world and went to the western limit. He bore witness to the rulers and then passed out of this world. The British and Congressman reject, oh sorry, object that payment betrays no knowledge of a journey to the east and a release from prison. But this is just silly. A writer referring to the Finish western limit idea, at please. this time. Sorry? Finish up that idea, please. Okay, this is my last, my last, I'm just finishing now. Um, a, a writer referring to the Western Limit at that time in the ancient Near East um, was always referring to Spain. Um, you can look at that on page 17 of George W. Uh, Nigg's work. Though some have tried to equivocate by saying that Clement of Rome was referring to Rome as the Western Limit which would be ridiculous since Clement was writing from Rome. And I yield. All right. So we have a 10-minute opening by Jefferson. Jefferson, go ahead whenever you like. When you start, the time will roll again. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Richard, for hosting uh, me and Gavin. I know that this topic really isn't of all that much interest to you, so... Uh, thanks for your patience and charity. Thanks, Gavin, for inviting me to debate this topic with you. Uh, so I'm going to, in, in my opening, I'm going to wind things back a little bit and start with something a little bit more general, just some general information to kind of get a little bit better uh, view on this kind of thing historically. So um, there, are, I mean, starting with the very basics, there's 27 books in the New Testament and 13 of them are the Pauline epistles. And of those 13, seven are considered to be undisputed letters. Um, they're orthonymous documents, meaning they claim to be written by Paul and modern critical scholars accept and attest that this is factually accurate. Um, those include First Thessalonians, which is the first book of the New Testament, chronologically speaking, First and Second Corinthians, Philippians, Philemon, Galatians, and Romans. Um, and I've kind of, that's kind of in rough chronological order. Um, these predate the gospels. 
The remaining six epistles form two different groups of disputed letters. And these are the letters where there's scholarly divide regarding authorship. The first set are the Deuteropauline epistles. They include 2 Thessalonians, Ephesians, and Colossians. It's about a 50-50 divide, more or less, between scholars about whether or not Paul actually wrote those or not. Uh, first and Second Timothy and Titus are called the pastoral epistles. And amongst those six letters total, they share the most scholarly consensus of having not been written by Paul. In fact, it's almost unanimous at this point. Uh, so for the purposes of this debate, we're, we're focusing on First Timothy. Um, Hebrews is sometimes considered to be one of the epistles, the 14th epistle. It's not attributed to Paul and it's not written as an epistle. It's actually a homily. Um, the author remains anonymous. So and, and as far as scholars are concerned, that's just it's outside that category. Um, so the real question is, um, what are the chance? What makes a document like, you know, the, the pastoral epistles true or false? So. Uh, it's it's a controversial claim uh, to make to Christians um, to suggest that there are books within the Bible whose authorship is falsely ascribed, especially when they actually they, they state that this book was written by so and so. However, we know of writings left outside the canon that were forgeries, that is written in Paul's name. We have a third letter to the Corinthians. We have the Acts of Paul and Thecla, and we have the letters of Paul and Seneca. Forgeries were common in the ancient world, and the proof of that comes from writers throughout the era who attest to the practice and warn their readers about it. The ancient physician Galen wrote an entire book dedicated to informing his readers about how they could know for certain whether they were reading an authentic book from Galen. Um, we even have proof from the Bible that forgeries were a concern, and that is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1-2. through 2. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So this seems to suggest a couple of different things. If Thess Second Thessalonians wasn't written by, was written by Paul, Paul is attesting to the reality of forgeries and letters being circulated amongst the Christian community. If the scholars that are skeptical of it are right, and it was actually written by someone uh, falsely ascribing to be Paul, then it's a verisimilitude being used to bolster the seeming authenticity of the letter. Um, either way, they're attesting to a very real phenomenon that people were familiar with, that is, forgeries exist. Um, so this prompts the question, since forgeries were common during this historical period, what are the chances that pseudepigraphal writings became canonized? Well, it turns out, according to the consensus of most modern critical scholars, it's very good, which is why many believe that the pastoral epistles were written by a later author who used Paul's name to bolster the authority of the message. So we can see that there's a precedent for pseudepigraphal writings, but it's a very different thing to say that there were forgeries in the ancient world in general, and then to say that there are forgeries in the Bible. So what makes scholars think that the pastoral epistles are pseudepigraphal? Uh, indications that scholars began to have doubts regarding the authenticity of authorship of the pastoral epistles and 1 Timothy in particular were apparent in the early 19th century and possibly even earlier. It was argued then and still is now that the vocabulary and the ideas expressed were at odds with those found in the other letters of Paul. According to A.N. Harrison, there are 848 different words used in the pastoral letters and 306, over one third of them, do not occur in any other Pauline letter. Two thirds of those 306 words are used by secondary century, uh, second century Christian writers. Words used in common between 1 Timothy and the undisputed Pauline epistles often have a different meaning. For example, faith in Paul's letters is usually described in the sense of a relationship, as in faith in Christ. In 1 Timothy, the meaning of faith seems to be the body of Christian teaching, which is to say, the faith. They also differed on the notion of works. While it's generally accepted by scholars that Paul's meaning of works refers to fulfilling Jewish law, 1 Timothy uses the word works in the sense of doing good deeds. 1 Timothy contains different ideas regarding marriage, women, and soteriology. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul emphasized that people should remain single. He doesn't condemn marriage, but he prefers that people devote themselves solely to God. However, in 1 Timothy, to assume a leadership role in the church, a bishop or deacon, which, by the way, are terms Paul never uses in his undisputed letters, both those roles, the men must be married. As for women, they would be saved by, quote, bearing children. Both concepts are unusual ideas from an apostle that believed the end of time was coming soon. He also establishes with the letter a patriarchal hierarchy for the family and the church, 
which is at odds with his statement, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. The more sophisticated rigid church organization described in 1 Timothy is solid evidence that the letter is more accurately dated later in the first century after Paul's ministry. And now there's also problems with the timeline. So the historical setting described in 1 Timothy includes descriptions of false teachings, which include myths and genealogies, and advocation for ascetic practices, such as abstinence from sex and certain foods. These descriptions match the practices and teachings of early Gnostic groups that arose around the end of the first century, after Paul's ministry would have ended. The reason for the end of his ministry? Tradition holds that Paul likely died in the late 60s CE, toward the end of the reign of Nero. In 1 Clement, uh, which was written around 95 CE, it states that Paul's death occurred during Nero's persecutions of Christians. So the simplest reason for Paul not being the author of 1 Timothy is that he was dead before it was ever written. Um, and then another thing to take into account with this, too, is the, the tradition that was happening here during the early stages of Christianity. It's important to know because a lot of Christians, I don't know, uh, really, really get a full picture of this. Paul would have died before the Gospels were ever released. Paul never read the Gospel of Mark. He was likely dead before that one came out. And that one was released in 70 CE. Now, Jesus was executed in 30 to 33 CE. So you had basically a 40-year period of Christian tradition happening with no Gospels in place. It was an oral tradition, and it was being spread by a lot of these different teachers and preachers. So it was evolving organically over time. There wasn't a writ written message. It's easy for us to take a look at the New Testaments and see the Gospels being placed first as sort of the starting point, and then Paul kind of branching off from that and going second. But that's not actually how it worked. Um, as it turns out, the Gospels are a product of Christianity. Christianity is not a product of the Gospels. And so that's actually important when taking a look at the inconsistencies we see with these letters, because if you try to harmonize the pastoral epistles and the pseudo-Pauline epistles with the undisputed epistles, you actually diminish some of the impact that the changes would indicate. If you focus on those changes and examine them and look at them through the course of history, what you see is a pretty good indication of the evolution of a faith tradition as it matured over time and as it changed. Paul's focus and emphasis was on the end of days. He was very much an apocalyptic teacher. But by the time his death ended and his ministry was over and the church continued to persist, they had to change their focus. And so the pastoral epistles start focusing on the long-term focus and, and goals of the church itself. So it makes sense that this would happen, but that's also, I think, in, in, in the broadest scope of it, that's the best indication that we have that Paul was not, in fact, the author of the pastoral epistles. It was someone else writing with his name and trying to establish a tradition of Paul evolving towards that long-term uh, you know, church goal. And with that, I yield the balance of my time. Thank you. All right. Um, so those who are in the side chat, you are welcome to um, start entering your questions that you might have for either of the debaters. And we'll be asking that as we wrap up uh, the show today. Uh, for now, we go into the five. Um, or I'm sorry, we go into the open discussion. So, gentlemen, uh, I will not interrupt unless I think things um are going too fast or or over talking is going on and the floor is Do I go first, Richard? sure okay um uh right now uh jefferson you made the, the comment Almost there's almost unanimous um, agreement among scholars that First Timothy was not written by Paul. Do you want to tell me who those scholars are? Uh, if it's uh, unanimous, uh, there there actually was one of the the links that I have in the citation. I think it's from Raymond F. Collins mentions that, and that's from 2004, so it may have changed. But he actually mentions on, that there are only two scholars that mount any kind of defense really for Pauline authorship of the pastoral epistles in general and first Timothy. And I'm blanking on the names, but it's actually in that book. Uh, one of them um, is kind of interesting. His name is Luke, uh, 
Luke James, I'm blanking on his last name, he, he offers an interesting take on it because while he believes that Paul is the author of the pastoral epistles, he concedes that there is no reasonable evidence to conclude uh, that, that that is the case. There, there's no proof of it. He just thinks that it is the case. So your, so, so your position is that um, there is unanimous agreement among New Testament scholars that 1 Timothy was not written by Paul. Near, it's nearly unanimous at this point, yes. That's okay, well, that, that's, that's not what the scholars I read um, are saying, so we'll put that one aside for the moment. You also made the, 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 the statement about uh, forgeries existing. Forgeries existing. Um, that sounds like an argument from silence to me. Why is that? Well, if if you're claiming um, First Timothy is a is a forgery, mm -hmm. you need evidence, and right. I haven't seen much. I haven't seen much, so that's why I say it's an argument from silence. Well, I I actually mentioned three different works that were written in Paul's name, the Acts of Paul and Thecla. Uh, the letters of, of Paul and Seneca, which is a kind of an interesting story because they, someone decided that it wasn't, it wasn't good that Paul was that influential amongst the Christian groups, but not known throughout the greater Roman world. And so uh, they decided that it would be really interesting if Seneca was a fan. And Seneca at the time um, was something of an advisor to uh, Nero around the time. He was one of the bigger uh, philosophers well known. And so they concocted this kind of idea that not only Seneca was corresponding with Paul, but Seneca also was recommending Paul's writings to Nero, which is kind of interesting. Well, what makes Nero then what kind of think, framed Christians. Yeah, what, what makes you think that Paul died, was dead before the Gospels were written? Uh, because the dating of the undisputed letters, most all of it happens in the 50s, possibly even early 60s. Um, even even Second Timothy is supposedly written from a jail cell where Paul's writing from Rome, and he's, he's I believe he's looking forward to like a second trial of some kind. Um, it's it's a traditional the traditional idea is that he was he met his end close to the death of Peter, and Peter was crucified uh, notoriously upside down in the mid '60s, also during the reign of Nero, and so it's been uh, sort of attributed to to early church tradition that Paul was okay. so, possibly so, martyred so, around. So the, the letter, the letter, hold on, hold on. You're chewing up a lot of time here. Um, the letter First Corinthians, that would be come under one of the undisputed um, Pauline authorships, correct? Yes. So First Corinthians chapter 15, 3 to 8, that's been dated by secular and Christian historians to AD 30 to 35. Okay, that actually makes my point for me. So if he was writing even earlier, that means he could have died easily in the 60s. Well, it's it's fairly common knowledge that he was he was executed under under Nero. Right, somewhere that's what between it, somewhere between 63 to 67. Right, because Nero's reign ended in 68. So so you you're saying that that he he died well after the Gospels were written. No, he died before even the first Gospel was written. The first Gospel would have been Mark, and that was written around 70. So he wasn't no, even... No, that's not correct. That's not correct. Um, both secular scholars and Christian scholars date the Gospels a lot earlier than what you're claiming. No, no nowhere don't. near 70, nowhere near AD 70. No, the newest dates are that I'm citing, that's consensus. Mark was written somewhere around 70 CE. No, that's not the consensus. That's, that not, my, the consensus. that's not what my scholars are saying. Uh, most of your citations are dated as early as in, in the 40s, Gavin. I took a look at them before we started. Which matters not. Which matters not. It does if new new information and new dating technology. No, 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 no. You cannot uh, ascribe evolution to, to commentaries. Um, to exegesis and to hermeneutics. I'm talking about scholarly research and updates. Yeah, I'm talking about scholarly exegesis to documents that are 3,000 years old. Those documents, 3,000, 2,000 years old, those documents don't change, right? Uh, so, are any of those documents originals, Gavin? Um, gosh, guess what, sir? 
everybody knows they're not. There's no originals. Okay, so then what are we, why are we talking about the original date of those documents? What we're trying to get to is the consensus of when we we're think the original, about the original date. Correct. We're talking about the original date um, as ascribed by professional, secular, and Christian historians. So am I. So secular historians have dated 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through to 8, as written by Paul, to AD 30 to 35. Okay, what, what, what is your evidence for that? What's your citation for that? What scholar or what, what study? It's in, it's in my list of citations. Yeah, I know. Which one? It's in my list of citations. I know. Which okay? one? No, 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 no. We're not going to play the semantic citation game. You're citing, you're citing the fact that this particular portion of 1 Corinthians is dated earlier than anything else scholars think Paul wrote. Paul was writing in the late 40s through to the early 60s. So you've got one that's written 10 years before his earliest stuff as far as any scholar that I've come across. And out of the citations that you've sure. shared, you don't know which oh one said that. Sure. This is my time. I'll make it easier for you. Uh, Gavin, this is our time. This is a free exchange, and you've been asking all the questions so far. Uh, this is an open discussion, and for whatever reason, for Gavin, for Gavin, you're accidentally dropping yourself from the stream. I'm bringing you back in as quickly as I can. Uh, please be careful of whatever's happening there. This is supposed to be an open discussion, yes. Hello, test, test. Your, your sound is good. Test. Go ahead, sir. How's the sound? Yeah, test. Mr. Spatchcock, I'll make it easy for you. Um, go to Wikipedia and type in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through to 8. Are you getting all of your stuff from... Hello? Hello. Jefferson, your mic is muted somehow, please. Sorry, I don't know how that happened. Must have slipped. What were those verses, Gavin? It was 15 verses what? First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 8. You can Wikipedia them right now. Dead air. I'm, I'm actually looking them up. Is there anything else? A lot that you of dead air. A lot of dead air. You asked me to look them up, and I'm looking them up now. I'm not actually finding a Wikipedia article for them. I'm just finding Bible Gateway stuff. And it would have been easier if you just told me which source told you that they were dated that old. I've just told you. Go to Wikipedia. Type into Wikipedia First Corinthians verses three to eight. And I wrote, and I pulled up 1 Corinthians 15 on Wikipedia. This article uncritically uses text from within a religion or faith system without referring to secondary sources that critically analyze them. Please help improve this article by adding references to reliable okay, secondary okay. sources All with right. multiple okay. points so of view. The game has started already. The game playing has started already. There's a so warning on the, on the accuracy of this at the very top, Gavin. No, we're going to move on from there because um, you can actually look that up after the debate's finished. Okay, so well, I appreciate that. You were asking me to look it up now, and I did, and it's bogus. It's, no, it's, no. It's not a good Wikipedia. No, 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 no. Anyone in the chat that's not an atheist, just type in to Wikipedia, 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 3 to 8, and you'll see it, and you can confirm it in the chat. Um, I'm not, look, sir, sir, look, I'm not into game playing, Okay. Neither am when I. I when, are you playing games when, when, when I'm doing a debate, when I'm doing a debate, I take it quite professionally. I don't do these silly semantic game playing antics that you're getting up to. So Which, have you got any, have you got any um, intelligent questions for me? Yes, I do. Um, well, first, my first question was, what source was it that you found that dated that particular segment of First Corinthians at that age? I've told you to look at look in your list of stuff on and then Wikipedia. Okay. On Wikipedia. 
Okay. And Wikipedia is not reliable because it's actually telling me right at the jump that it's this is not a reliable article. It's the only one I found for First Corinthians. 15. Yeah, well, you're not looking hard enough and you're wasting time. Now, I, may, I, I, think, I think I need to remind you, the subject is the authorship of First Timothy. Right. So can we move on? But we're still on the subject of First Timothy. We're talking about Pauline authorship. So what I'm wondering from your particular opening, you said something, I think you opened with a portion of the letters themselves attest to the fact that they're written by Paul. The openings in First and Second Timothy are nearly identical, but they're nothing like any of, of Paul's other letters. They're totally well, different. So what? so what? Does that mean they're forgeries? No, it, it provides evidence that they were probably written by the same person. And given that both letters are so very different from the seven undisputed letters, it's likely that all, all three pastoral epistles were not written by Paul. No, that's an argument from silence. Um, it really isn't. It's actually based on the, the fact that the style and the vocabulary of, of the letters are completely of course, different. Of course, of course they were written by the same person, which was Paul the Apostle. Now, here's something important to bear in mind. The early church fathers, and very quickly this morning, I had a, had a, had a good look at them, and um, a couple of them were born AD 35. Now, there's 35, 35 early church fathers who all attest that Paul was the author of First Timothy. Two of them, Polycarp of Smyrna and uh, Ignatius of a Antioch, Polycarp was a disciple of John the Apostle and Ignatius was a student of John the Apostle. None of these guys, none of these guys, there's 35 of them. Do you want me to read their names? Only if you want to. Um, I may come back to that because the point I'm making is that the early church fathers, the second generation of apostles, never, never ascribed the authorship of 1 Timothy Second Timothy or Titus to anybody but Paul the Apostle. How do you explain that? Well, they were seeking to assemble a canon, so I'm not exactly, and, and it was debated. One nothing of the, to one do of, with the canon. No, nothing to do with the canon. Yeah, it did. Um, one of the reasons, one of the things that came up that was kind of unusual around that time was that in the first century, Marcion, who was a huge fan of Paul and his his philosophies, his writing, he created his own testament, his own canon Bible, and he only included the 10 letters of Paul. Okay, I'm not interested in him, and I'm not interested, interested in your game of goalpost shifting. Clement of Rome... That is not goalpost shifting. I was, Rome, providing, I was providing first Clem, century and Clement second of century. Rome, Clement of Rome was born AD 35, right? Yes. In his letter from Rome, he attests about Paul's martyrdom and he attests that he never says anything about First Timothy being forged or not written by Paul. That would be an argument from silence. Just because he didn't say it doesn't mean that he didn't have his doubts. Oh, my goodness. It, it works both ways, Gavin. No, that's an argument for, from ignorance. First no, Clement, uh, chapter 5, 6 to 7, indicates that Paul was released. The letter contains these lines. Paul preached in the east and the west and won noble renown for his faith. He taught righteousness to the whole world and went on to the western limit. He bore witness to the rulers and then passed out of this world. Debilis and Consulman, who are, who are objectors to uh, Pauline authorship, object that Clement betrays no knowledge of a journey to the east or of a release from prison. But this is just silly. A writer referring to the western limit at that time in the A&E, right, in the A&E, still in the first century, the tail end of the first century, when they referred to the western limit, they always meant Spain, Though some have tried to equivocate, some sceptical people try to equivocate um, by saying that Clement is referring to Rome as the Western Limit, which is stupid because Clement was writing from Rome. What does that have to do with Paul's authorship of the pastoral epistles? Um, well, he is, 
fathers. He's one of the early church fathers. Okay. Um, that says nothing um, about Paul's letters to Timothy or Titus being forgeries. Now, if they were forgeries, well, they wouldn't. Have called, no, 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 no. They wouldn't. They wouldn't have called them forgeries. No, you're right. They wouldn't have. They would call them forgeries if they were forgeries. It, yeah, but once they've put their imprimatur on them and they've given them their, their stamp of approval, no, they probably wouldn't have been so apt to call them. They're traditionally attested to be from Paul, but that was done after many, many years of discussions and internal wranglings within the early church. And now that it's settled, it's basically assumed to be the case. No. From a theological and a Christian perspective. No. Scholars Clement, was writing, Clement, was writing, Clement was writing in AD 96, well before anything was canonized. AD right. 96, well right. before anything was canonized. Yes, first Clement was written in 95, and that's where it's mentioned in that book. And it's not enti we're not entirely certain that Clement actually wrote first Clement, but it's just assumed that he is. But when he wrote that, he's the one that traditionally associates Paul's death occurring before the end of Nero's reign, which would have been before 68 CE or around right at uh, 68 CE at the latest. So Paul died before the first gospel came out. And it seems that's like based on the circumstances described in the natural epistles, those are happening later in the end of the first century. That is absolute nonsense. The late dating of the gospels, including the, uh, the gospel of John, um, is a lot a lot earlier than than what you're saying. It's only skeptical atheists who will give very late datings to the Gospels. You know, for goodness sake, I've given you um, a pre-Pauline creed that was in wide circulation orally between AD 30 and AD 35 that has been dated by secular and Christian historic historians, secular and Christian historians. And when I asked you for proof, you can't even identify it in your list of citations. I'd be happy to take a look at it. Pause for a moment, please. Well, if uh, Gavin, the, the last, the 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 last time you overspoke, it was a lot longer than three seconds. I, I can't think that that's the time delay. Okay, so let's be more polite to each other, please. Sure, my apologies. If someone in the chat who's on the right side, if they can Wikipedia, 1 Corinthians, verses 3 to 8, and just put in the chat, um, there's, uh, I think it's a paragraph or a sentence, and it's something along the lines of nearly every New Testament scholar agrees that this was a pre-Pauline creed that was written sometime between AD 30 and AD 35. If you can do that and put it in the chat for me, I'd really appreciate it. Because I'm, yeah, I'm actually talking on my phone. I don't have a laptop. Yeah, Gavin seems to be hanging his entire argument on this. And I, I'm curious to see that because I haven't actually heard that. There is one from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which is a statement from Paul that they don't believe is actually from Paul, that it was actually edited in at a later date to help kind of make 1 Corinthians, Corinthians uh, better coincide with First and Second Timothy, some of the ideas presented in there. Um but that's also a little bit hinky. One of the things that, that comes up is like, I must be using only secular atheist scholars. If you look at my citations, one of them, uh, just, just to point out, Raymond F. Collins, First and Second Timothy and Titus, a commentary, even just within the introduction, his introduction, this guy's a, a Catholic friar, very, very devout. He, is a, he believes in God. He believes in the authority of the Bible. But when he writes his, even just in the introduction, it's apparent that he is writing from the assumption that scholars have more or less, the consensus is that the pastoral epistles could not have been written by Paul. They're just too different. And the, 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 the descriptions of the events and the circumstances that surround the church at the time reflect a later date in the first century, possibly even the early second century of the Christian church. And the words being used and the terminology being used were not Pauline. So what? So that's evidence that it was written by someone else who was just using Paul's name. No. Now, some of questions um, <laughs> Paul's also, since these letters have a wide vocabulary and range of style than some of the other letters ascribed to Paul. It should be noted, however, that Paul had a very high level of education and wide exposure to various groups in the Mediterranean world. 
So Most importantly, the letters are consistent with Paul's general message to the churches. The letters are thought to have been written between AD 62 and AD 67. Although the book of Acts does not detail what happened during the last years of Paul's life, historians have generally concluded that Paul was first imprisoned in Rome about AD 60 to 63. Then he was set free for a period. Both 1 Timothy and Titus present Paul as traveling freely in the Eastern Mediterranean regions to Ephesus, and you'll see that in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, chapter 3, verse 14, um, Crete, that's in Titus 1, 1 verse 5, and Nicopo Nicopolis, 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 in the Eastern Adriatic Sea, that's in Titus chapter 3, 12. The letters, as we know, as 1 Timothy and Titus were written during this period of freedom, most likely between AD 63 and 64. Okay. Paul appears to have been imprisoned again in 65 to 67 AD. He wrote 2 Timothy during his, impri during his imprisonment, as you've alluded to, um, and early church tradition states that the Roman Emperor Nero executed Paul in the late 65 or early 67. Right, but it could have just been the case that someone who was also using Paul's name was roughly aware of when he would have been imprisoned and executed in Rome and used that timeline to create a narrative around his stories to, as a verisimilitude to support the authenticity no, of the letters no, he was No. If they were forgeries, why Which would 35... If they were forgeries, why would 35 of notable notable early church fathers, the second generation of, of apostles, say they were they were authored by Paul. I can't speak to why the other than bias, I can't speak to why uh, oh, come the, on. I can't come speak on. there were there were people in the second century that believed Polycarp wrote the pastoral epistles. But did you did you find that in your research? Sir you're equivocating, and um, you're not I'm moving not this way. I'm asking you, did you, did you run a very well? There were discussions amongst contemporaries in the second century, even the third century church, that speculated Polycarp wrote the pastoral epistles. That went on for quite a while. There's actually uh, There was actually one of the scholars that I, I read, it may have even been Raymond F. Collins, was sort of kind of flirting with the idea that maybe that was the case, that Polycarp actually was the author. But of course, th there's not enough evidence to prove that one way or the other. So just because they finally decided this is, this is traditionally what we're going to ascribe to it doesn't mean that they were completely in agreement. And it doesn't mean that disagreements didn't occur. Just because you've cited 35 early church historians, how does that erase anything that modern critical scholarship has dug up in the last 40 years? Hell, even in the last 20 okay. years. So what, you're doing now, what you're doing now is you're committing the fallacy of uh, presentism, right? Presentism. Now, that 35 not, early, ch okay. early church fathers, yeah, 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 you're committing the presentism fallacy. You're using no, 20, 21st century glasses to look back at what was written 2000. I, I, know, I know what you're trying to say. That's not actually the point of what I was trying to say, but go on. Now, we've got 35 influential, notable early church fathers. Polycarp of Smyrna, Ignatius of Antioch, Clement of Rome, Papias of Heropolis. Those are just the first four. There's a hell of a lot more. All of them, all of them assigned First Timothy authorship, authorship to Paul the Apostle. If anyone was in a position to, to call, call it as a forgery or a fake, it would have been these guys. These guys were the second generation of apostles, straight after John. Right? So as, as early church fathers, if they wanted to make sure that those were included and they wanted to make sure that they really had the authority of Scripture, they had a reason to make sure that people felt that they were confident that they were written by Paul. Because if they those letters, if it turned out those letters were written by Polycarp, they just wouldn't carry the same weight. Well, yeah, obviously. So they have a reason to do that. Yeah, because they were authentic. Or they wanted people to think they were. Well, that's that's an atheist meme, and you're happy to believe that, but I think it's quite silly. It's actually a point brought up by, by, by scholars who are believers. 
have brought that. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, do you hang, hang on? Who are these scholars? Tell me who they are. I'm going to tell you the same thing you told me. Check the list of citations that Richard was so nice to put in the description. My citations. All right, I'll do that. I'll do that. But I can tell you now that the early church fathers had no reason to lie. If the uh, if the pastorals were not written by Paul, it would have been called by these guys. Do you think so? I know so. Do you but think they, Christians lie? Do you think Christians lie just to make the, the Bible have, sound good? Because they would have had to edit the text. They would have had to cut the beginnings out where the actual letters, the author of the pastoral epistles says he's Paul. So That's right. if it's fraudulent, he's lying boldface to the reader, which most scholars think is exactly what he did. No, look, you keep saying most scholars, okay? Most I don't people. believe you for a minute. Most I do not believe you for a minute, but I will check your citations, and I will not be surprised if these citations you provide are from fringe um, liberals or from just odd people that are not sort of mainstream scholars or historians. They're, they're pretty mainstream. Um, even, even in some theological circles, they're mainstream. Well, that remains to be seen. Well, please take a look at them and do your research, then you can get back to me if you think I'm trying to pull the wool over your eyes. My argument is based on the readings that I've done. That is a sampling of some of the readings that I've done on this topic, which is why I cited them. That's why I'm making the argument from it. I haven't yeah, well, your, well, argument, your, your, argument is fallacious. your argument is fallacious. Totally How fallacious. Is fallacious? Because you're using the same atheist meme that all skeptics use. Your date, okay. I'm you're using, using reasons that are used by believers, Gavin. Believers have, have used the same argument on the question of question in authorship. You're using straw men like the Gospels for a start. Okay, I was nothing. Using that, I was using that as an example of showing the time period in place to give a perspective on what the dates, what what's the period of time occurring in within Paul's ministry. That's just to provide context. I'm not trying to set that up as some kind of straw man. You are yeah, engaging no, in what's yeah. called a fallacy, fallacy yeah. where you listen That's to what yeah. I say and you imagine it's a fallacy and then accuse me of it. No, it is a fallacy because which uh, one? The universal, the uni as, as far as the Gospels are concerned, um, it's universally accepted amongst secular, even Bart Ehrman, your guru, even above, even above, even among, sorry, atheist New Testament scholars, the dating of the of the Gospels is is way earlier than than like say AD yeah. seventy. Bar, I've right? cited two of Bart Ehrman's work. His most recent textbook and a book that he wrote in 2011 called, or 2012 called Forged. And in that, he cites the dating of the Gospel of Mark is around 70 CE. What does he say? What are the actual words he says? That Mark was written around 70 CE. He says that? Yes, he does. Multiple times in multiple books. And what is his what is his evidence or what is his yeah what is his buttressing evidence for for making that comment or that statement? Research he's done plus research he's cited, which includes I believe several Catholic scholars. But I'll have to uh, well, I don't um, I don't hold a lot of stock in Catholic literature. So that's one guy. That's one guy that's going against the tide. Well, the no. Tide. He, you just dismissed him. You and just dismissed him in any Christian other resources. Who the Gospels a lot earlier than 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 AD seventy. But anyway, let's let's get off that because it's a straw man. It's shifting the goalposts. Hang on, hang on. The one source is an introduction to New Testament studies. It's in, it's from Oxford University Press. It's intended as an introductory college course textbook. Most of the information in there is relatively. Tame. None of it is considered particularly controversial, and most of it's based on a lot of broad research from lots of different scholars from lots of different disciplines. But it mostly focuses on a lot of critical historical scholars. And in that textbook, these date ranges are cited as being the most accurate based on the most recent research and scholarship. So if you want to call that fringy, I would recommend you go and get a mainstream textbook that deals with the history of the New Testament 
open that book and take a read. I think you will be really surprised at what you find. Instead of using citations that I hardly, were I, from I, the 40s, 60s, 70s. I hardly, you're talking about one resource that goes against the tide the tide, the overwhelming tide of scholarship all the way back from AD 35 that attests to Paul being the author of First Timothy. You're citing one resource that goes against the tide of multiple resources, multiple people who are notable, who were scholars, who are scholars, that all ascribe First Timothy to the Apostle Paul. As far look, one ascribing, is one, ascribing one, one writing, is Gavin, you've been hang on, you've been talking quite a bit and you you seem to like to steal. Hang on. Stop. I know you got a three second delay, but you can stop for six seconds. Give it give it six seconds. Pause. Take a breath. The reason that I pointed out the New Testament textbook was because it's a mainstream one that's drawing from lots of different sources. So if you want to accuse me of cherry picking one scholar who's giving one very narrow specific opinion, you can just truck off with that because that's not what's happening. The, the dates being cited in there are being cited based on a consensus of many scholars. And the scholars that I have listed in the citations also tend to agree with that basic dating. So if you want to introduce this notion that you had these, the, the gospels were written 10, 20, 30, 40 years earlier, go right ahead. But tell me specifically which citations of yours that you've included are saying that those are the dates. What do you mean I can truck off? I can just truck off. If you're trying to make an argument that I'm trying to I'm trying to I'm trying to set up an argument based on one person's opinion, that is nuts. That's not what's happening. I have more than one person cited in my citations. Many of them agree with this general dating of the works of the Bible. I mean, do you disagree with the fact that Paul died before he could have read, read all the gospels? Just answer me that question. Um you are shifting the goalposts and you're straw manning. I'm trying to now, get a sense of your general I'm not going to play this game. And I would have expected, you know, a, a, a more professional um, adult sort of conversation. Have um, I done I anything that makes you think I'm being I less than that? I, I wouldn't expect my interlocutor to, to tell me to just truck off. Um, you need to grow up. All right, and act like an adult. This and is an you, adult debate. And you need to be a lot less condescending if you want to be considered mature in a debate. Grow a thicker there skin. We go. That's already here. We come here. We come with all the You're condescending. Right. You, you've been you've been, this, you've been going this way for a little while now. So just pump your brakes. I'm asking you where, what citation have you listed for this debate indicates earlier datings for the Gospels than what I've told than what I've said. Which one specifically? Can you can you name We're it? We're not talking about that. We're talking about Timothy post shifting and stop playing games. Now how is it only really a game for me to I ask? I told you, to you, you provided. Stop I'm asking you stop to goal point post shift that you provided. That is not a goalpost shift. I'm asking you to stand by your evidence. The debate is about the authorship of First Timothy. We're not I know. talking about the Gospels. So stop shifting the goalposts. Be you a man you that up. and argue your point in an adult way. You you brought up the point. You brought up the issue of the dating of the Gospels. You wanted to contest my issue with the reading of the Gospel of, of the Gospels. I was using the dating of that to show that roughly when Paul well, made if I, to, if I wanted to contest your issue, if I wanted to contest if I wanted to contest your issue with the dating of the Gospels, that must mean you brought up the Gospels, sir. But when we started talking Boom. about... Gavin, come on. Don't be childish. Now it's my turn to be condescending. <laughs> my apologies. Look, if we're going to talk about the timeline, the timeline matters. The issues brought up in 1 Timothy don't really co coincide with a lot of the issues that happen in the undisputed Pauline letters. Even the dynamics of the church change. 
The way that Paul talks about the church and about its organization, people are one in Jesus Christ. Uh, once you're sanctified, everyone gets a gift and they all work together in sort of a commune. But the rest of the Pauline epistles are based on this idea that the end is coming soon. Now you get the pastoral epistles and you're talking about offices of bishop and deacon, a federated Godhead uh, family structure. The bishops and deacons must be long-term Christian converts of good character and definitely married. Those are very different viewpoints from what Paul was dealing with in the undisputed epistles. That has to mean something in the balance of evidence. No, not at all. <laughs> okay. And so, Gavin, has anyone written any questions? Does anyone have any questions for us? Or I have been saving questions for you guys. Whenever you guys are ready, we'll do that. What do you say, Gavin? You want to wrap this up? I got some drinking to do. Hello? Hello? Tis, tis. You're on, you're on mute, Richard. I can't. I can. He, I can see your mouth moving, but no sound. Sorry. We hear you, sir. Keep going. Okay. This this is nonsense. Talking about how Paul's uh, pastoral letters, First, Second Timothy, and Titus, are so different from his others. You know, skeptics like they question Paul's authorship since these letters have a wider vocabulary and range of style than some of his other letters. That have been ascribed to Paul where possible. But it should be noted, however, that Paul had a very high level of education and wide exposure to various groups in the Mediterranean world. Most no importantly, these are consistent with Paul's general message to the churches. The letters are thought to have been written between AD 62 and 67. I don't know what else to tell you. You've got no. early church fathers who were born in AD 35, and you've got this tide of scholarship, tide of biblical scholarship, all in favor of uh, the epistles of First and Second Timothy and Titus being ascribed to Paul. So I don't know what else to tell you. Okay, yeah, the newest the newest consensus on that is that the pastoral epistles were likely written in the end of the first century, so probably between 85 to 95, 98 CE, well after Paul's death. Um, so, fallacious I, argument. Fallacious no. argument. That, that isn't one. That's the, 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 the dating is based on the circumstances being described in the early church because they coincide with events that were occurring in the late first century or second century. The dialogue, the vocabulary and grammar that's being used fits the church of the late first century, early second century. Most of the issues that are being discussed don't seem to match anything that Paul would have really ever dealt with, uh, including things like church organization and the soteriology. The soteriology like the mention in uh, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2 about women gaining their salvation through the bearing of children. That is not a Pauline theological concept. Says who? Says most modern scholars that have studied Paul extensively, that know that his particular ministry dealt with a more apocalyptic view, an imminent return of Christ, an end of the world, an establishment of the kingdom of heaven, not the kind of long, and not only that, but Paul didn't seem pre totally preoccupied with the idea of this kind of hierarchical arrangement and family. The only evidence that you really get for that are some insert, possibly inserted uh, verses in 1 Corinthians that sort of contradict each other. And then the household laws that you get in Ephesians and Colossians, but those are the Deuteropoline letters. Those ones are also disputed. They may not have been written by Paul. I happen to think they're not written by Paul. Well, of course, of course you're going to say that because, because you're on the other side. What However, my side to do with it? The, weight, the weight of scholarship, the weight of scholarship,
Bullshit was on my side by far. By far. The weight of scholarship. You mean so the fact that you're using more references from the 40s, 50s, and 60s means you win by default? What about up? No, no, sir, what about sir, sir, do not be a silly boy. Do not be a silly boy. You're right. I'll send the myself. The weight of scholarship no. is on my side. The weight of scholarship is on my side. That's an Going, assertion coming that you, from, from, you haven't from, proven that. Coming from, coming from the early church fathers, the second generation of apostles throughout the centuries to present day, the weight of scholarship is always on my side. Okay, I thought that we, I kind of started like poking holes in the idea of the first, you know, of the early uh, church fathers with the fact that they had a bias to see that those, if they wanted those pastoral letters to be included to sort of to serve as a bulwark for early Christian, uh, the early church organization, they would have liked to have continued the idea that, you know, the popular idea that, hey, they're from Paul. So why not just endorse that view? I mean, what you're I saying is actually true. It is traditionally, there's a difference. Traditionally, they are ascribed to Paul. But critically, historically, that doesn't hold up. That's the difference. Well, the scholars that I read, right, both secular, both Christian, all attest to First Timothy being authored by Paul. I, I, I understand that, that that's your claim, and I understand that you're asserting that that must be the case. What I'm presenting in my argument is that critical scholars almost unanimously doubt that, and I happen to agree with them. It doesn't actually add up. There's too many differences going on. It just doesn't of make course, a lot of sense. Of course you're going to agree with them. Of course you're going to agree with them because you're an atheist. Of course what you're going have, to agree with them. What does that have to do with it? However, 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 since the early church fathers, all throughout the centuries, the weight of evidence has always been on Paul being the author of First and Second Timothy plus Titus. I have a I have a, a question for you because you seem to be developing kind of a, a, an emotional reaction to this. So I am curious. Let's say that it's the case that I'm right and the scholars are right and that Paul didn't write the pastoral epistles. Does that make the, the likelihood of God of the Bible being real more or less likely in your mind? Okay, we're not talking about whether God is real or not. And the last time I checked, uh, you had no qualifications in psychoanalyzing or psychology, so you can stop with those guys. I'm asking the question because it doesn't follow that just because I agree with that, I'm an atheist. There are Christians that agree. I'm, with not, this. Interested. I'm not interested. I am not interested in your psycho babble games, right? The, are you Stay interested? On topic. In the, hang on, Gavin. Are you interested in the idea? Because you made this claim. I wouldn't, I wouldn't accept that because I'm an atheist. But there are Christians that don't accept Pauline authorship. They completely believe in God. They believe in Jesus. They believe in the validity of the Bible. They just yeah. don't think Paul wrote those are, letters. Are you saying you don't accept the Pauline authorship of First Timothy? There are Christian scholars that don't accept his authorship of it. Yes. Who? What do you name think them? Who? Pete Who? ends for one. Pete ends just off the top of my head. Pete ends doesn't believe that. Who else? Some of the scholars that I've cited are Christian. Who Raymond else? F. Look at the scholars that I just mentioned. Raymond F. Collins, Raymond Berry. Those are both Catholic scholars. They, they're they still part of the church. They believe in God. They, they believe in Jesus. They do not believe Paul wrote the pastoral epistles. Okay, so you've cited me three scholars. Uh-huh, per your demand. Right. Three scholars that go against the tide of literally hundreds of secular and Chris, uh, Christian biblical scholars, uh, New Testament scholars throughout the centuries. Which secular, okay, just because now you might be appealing to like a tradition or like a, a like kind of a historical wave. 
Just because some of them were asserting it back in the day doesn't mean they're currently correct now. The latest research may not, may prove them wrong. And in most cases, it seems to do that. Like I said, even in 20, I think it was 2004, I believe it was Raymond Collins was pointing out that there were really only two scholars that were really defending the notion that Paul must have written the pastoral epistles. And he cites them by name. Now, that doesn't necessarily, that was, you know, 16 years ago. There might, there might have, you know, more may have emerged. But it is, it is considered nearly unanimous amongst the critical scholars. They don't think that Paul wrote them for the reasons yeah. that I've laid out. And there's more, there's more you evidence. Keep saying, you keep saying those words, you keep saying those words that it's nearly unanimous among scholars you, that would you, Paul would you like me to lie not and say that it's completely unanimous? You keep saying those words, but I don't think you know the meaning of those words. Like I said, the critical scholarship weighs heavily in favor of Paul being the author of First Timothy. No, it doesn't. Right from the early church fathers all through the centuries to modern day today. You need to you need to you need to update some of the scholarship that you've been reading. Take a look at even just the mainstream stuff, even in Christian textbooks. But there, there are people that go to Liberty University who study this stuff and they get this information. This is not controversial stuff. The only time it's controversial is if I'm talking to somebody who might be more of a the fundamentalist strain and just, oh, I can't believe someone would say something so infuriating. I'm not saying this to cast doubt on the Bible. I'm saying this because modern biblical scholars believe it's true. They've studied it, and their conclusion is it's a lie to think that the pastoral epistles were actually written by Paul. They're just okay. attributed. Okay, okay, okay. Seeing as you're so, seeing as you're so hung up on modern uh, textual criticism, name to me um, uh, the the twelve criteria that modern New Testament scholars have to follow in order to evaluate whether. Um, uh, a text is uh, accurate and reliable. Okay, before I do that, can I ask you one question? No, 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 no. Come on, name them. There's twelve of them. Are you are you a New Testament scholar? I've written them down, sir. Name them. No, I'm not your monkey, and you're not a New Testament scholar. So why you should can't. I? What? What is you that? Can't, what is can't, which shows you haven't done much prep at all. No, Gavin, all. I'm not, Gavin, I'm not here to so get. I think we've come to an impasse. I think we've come to an impasse. Gavin, I think we've come to an impasse. Gavin, would you, would, you like, would you like me to tell you? Tell you? Would you like me to educate you? You have been giving me stop. This is nonsense. That is a complete. You've been talking and accusing me of fallacies. That is a total non sequitur. I am citing the consensus of other scholars, not my own opinion, asking me if I know how to how, what what the a modern New Testament scholar needs to go through in order to become a New Testament scholar is totally irrelevant. I am basing this off the works of other established scholars who know and respect each other and communicate this information back and forth. This that's the consensus view. You asking me about whether or not I know those things and you happen to have the list pre-Googled is, that is ridiculous. That is a non sequitur. And if you don't know what that means, look it up. I'll put the spelling in the, in the private chat no, for you if you need it. No. What, is, what is ridiculous is that you are losing this debate by so much, you're going to need a knockout to get a draw. Do you know what right? dance law is? I'm just wondering. If we Do you know what dance law is? I'm just wondering if, if we can move on. The yeah. first person to declare can we move on to questions, is usually Richard, the loser, Gavin. Can we move on to questions, Richard? Because I'm a bit sick of this um, this chat. I don't understand why. Why do you do these if you get so worked up, Gavin? Why Why do you do these if you just become disgusted with the with the person that you've you invited me to have this discussion, and you've spent most of it preemptively declaring your victory, accusing me of fallacies when I didn't commit them. And then just, and when I asked you questions, you would answer me literally. This happened multiple times. You can ask people in the comments. You simply answered with no, like a child. Why are you Richard, engaging? Can we, move on to questions? You're going to be Richard, can we move on to questions, Richard? Yeah, he's not going to address that. Okay. Let's answer some questions and then let's end this because it's been an hour and 15 minutes. So. 
Okay, so we have a consensus, so we're going to go to the questions. I apologize for the background noise in my microphone. Uh, I'm aware of it. There's absolutely nothing I can do about it right now, and I'm sorry. Um, someone spoke, but I could make out none of it. If, Gavin, that was you, could you please move closer to your microphone again as you were before? Uh, it wasn't It wasn't me, sir. It wasn't me. Well, then, Jefferson, you're having a microphone problem. Would you please check it again? It's not coming from me. If you're talking about that tapping thing. No, the tapping thing is me. That that I'm aware of. But someone tried to speak, and I couldn't make out what they'd said. Oh, I, maybe that's an echo coming through. Does anyone have this video playing in the background? I have a plan in the background, but it's muted. All right. Okay, uh, the first question we received was from Sergeant Slim Jim, and he wrote it for Jefferson. And the question is something like, do you think it's likely that Timothy was written by a scribe or a disciple of Paul's who was simply summing up things he heard St. Paul say? Uh, yeah, there's actually kind of an interesting, I, I, I kind of think I have an interesting take on that. So there's a common thing among some theologians, and it's something that I even ran across when I was still going to church, was that if there's differences in the Pauline epistles, it was because of Paul's usage of an amanuensis, and that the style of the writing changed based on the scribe he was dictating it to. Um, more recent research has kind of put, put that into question. In fact, um, Bart Ehrman in his book Forged, he actually calls that, he's pretty hostile towards the idea that um, in, in citing evidence that in the first century, the idea of hiring a scribe is that they took dictation. They wrote what you said. The idea that someone kind of added their own flourish to it or kind of flushed it out. So it's more, it's less, less a scribe taking dictation and more like a ghostwriter flushing out the, uh, the details. And one of the reasons I would give for that is, is this. So Frequently what will happen is scholars will point out the stylistic differences of the pastoral epistles, especially say 1 Timothy. And they'll say, well, the reason that the wording, the vocabulary is different is because Paul's using a different scribe there than he was using for the undisputed letters. Okay, but that argument rests on an appeal to imprecise language. It's not exactly what Paul said, it's the gist of it taken down by this other person. But then another person will come along and say, hey, wait a minute, 1 Timothy chapter two has this little bit in there about women being, uh, silent and being submissive and that their salvation comes through bearing children. What's that about? And then I've heard these kind of apologetics where people will appeal to, oh, well, Paul was really good at inserting these weird little word games or logic puzzles into his stuff. So then that argument is a, an appeal to defense based on hyper precise language. So you end up getting two defenses that are at odds with each other. So no, in general, I don't think that it's the case. I mean, in terms of trying to uh, attribute it to a scholar, it's tempting to think that that's the case. But given the differences in, that doesn't take into account the differences in time. The issues that are happening in First Timothy were happening in the first, late first century, early second century church, and more than likely Paul was already dead. So even if you can make the argument that, okay, scribes actually put their own spin on a lot of their own writings, maybe so, Paul was still probably dead. And Gavin, did you want to answer to the same question, and would you like it reread? Um, no, no. I, I heard what Slim Jim said, and it's a really good question, actually. Now, there, there, it is possible. It is possible that First Timothy was actually physically written by Luke. Um, there is speculation about that. However, there's not enough evidence. There's not enough evidence to to ascribe the authorship. Um, to Luke, and we and we do know that that Luke acted as a scribe for Paul, but yeah, it's a good question by Slim Jim. Well, uh, well said. All right, going on to the next question from Benghazi uh, to Gavin. Have you read all your citations? Of course, it's your option to answer this or not. No, I'm going to skip that guy. He's a professional troll, Richard. Going on to the next question uh, from Jesus is the Rock. Yes, we know you're Jill. Question for the atheist. Do you have any argument against the authorship of Paul other than the style is different? 
Yes. Uh, one is because the content of the, like I mentioned before, the content of the letters indicates issues that were happening in the first church that likely happened in the late first century, early second century, well after Paul was dead. That's a good indication. Um, and also uh, the differences in soteriology and emphasis on church roles, um, which were not things that Paul even began to emphasize in his earlier his earlier writings. In fact, most of his writings, the emphasis was on, um, I hate to say this because it's going to get misconstrued and pulled out of proportion, but kind of a hippie dippy end of the world, you know, um, kind of a belief system in which, you know, it, Paul's undisputed letters seem to demonstrate an understanding that the end of the world was imminent, like it was going to happen before his life, before the end of his lifetime. He was going to see it happen. And to get into um, 1 Timothy, I mean, the reason they're called the pastoral epistles is because they're an appeal to how the churches should operate, how they should be organized, who should be in charge, certain roles that should be established. All of that indicates that it's stuff that's well past the point of Paul's ministry and it's getting into a new phase of early Christianity. And Gavin, would you like to comment that or, or have it reread? Could could you reread it, please, sir? No problem. Um, do you have any argument against the authorship of Paul other than the style is different? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's tons. Look, Second Timothy. Um, has been dated by secular and Christian historians as the last epistle that Paul wrote. It was very dark in its content. First Timothy and Titus were written when Paul was free. Uh, he was roaming around. He went to Spain. He just uh, roamed around everywhere sharing the gospel. Um, the fact that he uses different wording and different sentence structure in First Timothy is is just so asinine as an excuse to say that it's not written by by Paul. You know, Paul was a learned man. He had a very wide vocabulary and a, and a large range of of writing styles. Um, yeah, you know, and he was and, and and he had great exposure to various groups in the, in the Mediterranean world. Um, the important thing is that his letter, First Timothy, um, is consistent with the general message to the churches. It's consistent with the general message to the churches that he always wrote in all of his letters. I yield. All right, so the next question from Praise I Am That I Am for Spatchcock. Daniel Wallace writes, in sum... Mark should be dated before the production of Luke's gospel, which we date no later than 62 CE. Sometimes in the mid-50s is most probable. Okay, yeah. Uh, my general understanding of the timeline based on like, the, the, the most current research is that Mark is the first gospel and was written in seven, around 70 CE. Matthew and Luke would have come out about the same time, probably 10, 15 years later, 80 to 85 CE. And we didn't get the Gospel of John until the end of the first century, sometime around 95 CE, uh, possibly earlier or later, give or take. Um, I'm not exactly sure about the source that Praise is citing there. There are people that make arguments that roll back the dates. Um, generally, I, I would I don't know who that got that, that particular citation from, but I wouldn't be surprised to find that they're uh, in the minority in terms of dating, uh, most just general readership on trying to get a handle on when the books of the New Testament were written, cite those date ranges. Okay, so in case you wanted to look that up later, Jefferson, that was a quote by Daniel Wallace. I don't know where the quote is. It's not in the question. Uh, Gavin, would you like that reread and would you like to comment? Uh, can you reread it, please, sir? Daniel Wallace writes, in sum, Mark should be dated before the production of Luke's gospel, which we date no later than 62 CE. Sometime in the mid-50s is most probable. Yeah, okay, look, that's, that's a, a good statement and a good kind of question. All of the gospels were written far earlier than um, Mr. Spatchcock is saying. Um, that's easily provable by... Two major, two major events that happened within Christendom, 
One is the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. The next is the, the martyrdom of Paul and Peter. The Gospels never mention those important things. All right? They never mention them. Those, those were big-time things. So that brings, that brings the dating of the Gospels well down into the 50s ADs. And even John's Gospel, um, the Gospel of John, uh, is often referred to as like a, 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 like a post-Temple Destruction Gospel. Um, I think that's false. I would date it prior to 70 AD because the loss of your temple, if you're a Christian, <laughs> that's pretty major. You would mention it in a letter. I yield. And um, written by Benghazi for Gavin. Do you think there's any pseudepigrapha in the current bi biblical canon? Pass. He's a professional troll. You'll, you'll forgive me. And this is my opinion, which I don't usually give. It, it looks like he actually seriously wrote a question. I would be willing to answer that. Right, so can you repeat it, please? Do you think there's any pseudepigrapha in the current biblical canon? Pseudo, pseudo, what, what's the word, um, Richard? Pseudo, pseudepigrapha, meaning like 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 forged letters or forged books or something like that. Well, I'm 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 not trying to. Um have that kind of discussion right now, but it, you're welcome to answer it or not, or or Jefferson, if you'd like to take well, a crack. Well, if he's if he's meaning, yeah, his, his question is not clear. It sounds, and I know this guy's a professional troll and an atheist. If he's meaning, is there any forged documents in 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 the Bible? Then of course the answer is no. And Jefferson, did you want that reread, and would you like to address? No, um, um, I can I can address it, but yeah, I don't need it reread. Um, one of the other bits of evidence that we have for pseudepigrapha, other than the, you know, to I mean, the pastoral epistles I believe are pseudepigraphal. Um, I think the Deuteropauline uh, uh, letters very likely are, but also First and Second Peter um, are not written by Peter, um, and the evidence for that is that um, every description that we have in the Bible of Peter, there is simply no way that the man knew how to read or write let alone compose those letters with an extensive knowledge of the Septuagint when he probably wasn't even uh, capable of reading and writing in Aramaic, let alone Koine Greek. So those two letters are also very likely pseudepigraphal. And the next one's from Iron Charioteer for Gavin. Why did Marcion, 140 AD, when compiling the Pauline letters, did not include 1 Timothy and Titus? I I don't know what he's talking about, Richard. Uh, would rereading it assist you in any way, or is is that just uh, we're not going to address no, that? Right no, no, he's 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 another troll. So he's looking for a gotcha moment. And Jefferson, would you like that reread, or would you like to address it? Sure, read that back one more time. Certainly. Why did Marcion in 140 A.D. When compiling the Pauline letters, not include First Timothy and Titus. Yeah, that that is a good um, that is a good question. I, I think um, I, I've I've read up on some of this, but from what I understand, it was one of the things about Marcion not including the pastoral epistles sort of encouraged early Christian fathers to sort to that kind of helped push them in the right direction because. Um, Marcion was a, a, a docetist, and you know he did believe that Jesus was physically real, uh, physically here in body and spirit. I'm not. I don't remember the exact reasons why First Timothy and Titus were specifically uh, at issue, though. So that I can't. I can't really recall off the top of my head. Uh, the next question from Red Fang for Gavin. Gavin, would you please give your definition of a straw man? Um, yeah, you, Red Fang. And Jefferson, I suppose there's no need for you to address that. 
No, I, I I know very well what a straw man is. In fact, Jill accuses me of them all the time. Sorry, I didn't mean to bring up another YouTube user, but but also Gavin has well, accused me. Talking of about another straw. YouTube user. I already apologize, Gavin. I'm sorry. That was your you three just, seconds. Just can't, you just can't help yourself, okay. huh? You just can't help yourself. On. If we can move on, gentlemen, please. Sure. Uh, from Matt sure. Big, um, does Gavin own a red stapler? Answer truthfully, uh, please. Pass is my is my answer. He's a professional troll. Okay. The next question from Benghazi for Jeff. What scotch do you have and how much do you plan to consume after this? I have one answer for both parts of that question. All of it. And um, Gavin, I suppose you don't want to comment on that at all. No, I, do, I don't drink actually. Next question is from Maynard Saves. Question for Gavin. What would it mean to Christianity and if Paul, I'm sure he meant if Paul did not write Timothy? <clears throat> Um, it's a hypothetical question um, that belongs in the la-la land of atheism, so it's it's a relative. And Jefferson, would you like that reread? Yeah, just one more time. What would it mean to Christianity if Paul did not write Timothy? Uh, possibly nothing. I think it's actually more valuable to Christianity if instead of attempting to harmonize and force in the idea that they're all written by Paul, if the differences are actually um, illuminated more so that, and, and, and if they're laid out in a better historical timeline so that people can see how the faith uh, evolved over time. Because like I said before, if, if Jesus was crucified in around 30 CE, we didn't really, I mean, uh, Paul starts writing in around the 50s. Um, we don't get the first gospel until 70 C. We got a two, you know, we got two generations of Christians that um, are formed out of tradition, not out of uh, the gospels. The gospels aren't around yet. They're not around until the end of the first century. Um, so, and I think showing that how these letters, e even the fact that somebody went so far as to falsely ascribe letters in the name of Paul in order to get the authority to start putting into place these rules and regulations to further establish the church, I think is, is, you know, kind of significant. Um, and yeah, I think dealing with those, those, those inconsistencies and those troubles, those, uh, those, those problems, I think actually help paint a better picture, a broader picture of what uh, Christianity was originally like. Very good. Uh, for those in the side chat, I'm seeing new questions. I apologize that I don't have someone to help me with this. Uh, so um, as I'm reading these questions, I'm not able to take new ones. My apologies. I should have said so before, and I did not. Uh, the next question um, for Gavin. Gavin, could you please explain the default position of this debate uh, written by Oddjob? Oddjob. <laughs> Oddjob. Oh, my goodness. Can you, can you read it to me again, please, Richard? Certainly. Um, explain the default position of this debate. The default position of this debate is the authorship of First Timothy. And Jefferson, did you want that reread? No, that's okay. I'm not going to touch that. Uh. <laughs> Next question by Spartan Theology for Gavin. What impact do you think it would have on Christianity if we knew Paul did not write 1 Timothy? I'm sorry, that was already asked. If you want to defer that. Um, no, that's from Ethan. Can you say it again, please? 
Could you repeat it, please? Yes, sir. We have a delay. That is true. What impact do you think it would have on Christianity if we knew Paul did not write First Timothy? Um, if the early church fathers knew that Paul didn't write First Timothy, it would have zero impact on Christianity because it would be discarded as just a fake. And Jeff, would you like me to reread that for you? No, I'd actually kind of like to challenge um, what, what Gavin said there because he said they would be discarded as fakes, but earlier in the debate he said they would just have been, a, they would have been ascribed to the appropriate writer. So which one do you think would, be, would have been more likely, Gavin? What are you saying? What's your question? You were saying that they would have discarded them as fakes if they'd found out that Paul didn't, in fact, write them. But earlier in the debate, you told me that they would have just made sure that they were properly ascribed to the actual author. Which one do you think is more likely? So this was not part of the scheduled debate. If you both agree to it, it's fine. We'll go on with this. Um, we, we're, we're seeing more goalposts shifting and straw manning. If the early church fathers, uh, it was revealed to them that First Timothy was a forgery, not written by Paul. They would have just tossed it out. It would have never made the canon. Okay. Well, I suppose that brings us to uh, any closing thoughts. Um, and Jefferson would go last because at first um, Gavin went first. So if we would do it in that order, gentlemen, go right ahead, please. Sure. Yeah, I, I won't take too long. This, you know, unfortunately, this was a, a, a waste of time as far as I'm concerned. Um, the historical um, evidence is always on the side of the Pauline authorship of first, first and Second Timothy and Titus, um, right from the early church fathers right up until today. Um, uh, the last thing I would have expected from an adult interlocutor would be to be told just to truck off. Um, so the only thing I, I, I need to finish with is, Jefferson, can you give me a um, an affirmation that you will not send me hate mail after this debate is finished. I'm sorry, are, 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 your, are your comments closed? Are you done? Your turn. Yeah, just for clarification, are, are, Gavin, are you, are you closing your comments with that question? I don't want to. Yeah, I, I, I yield with that question. Can you make a public affirmation in front of everybody here that I'm not going to receive any hate mail from you. I solemnly swear never to send you an email. Let alone hate mail. Like, I, 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 there's no reason for me to email you after this. So what, I, I don't understand why I would send you hate mail. Why are you asking me that question? Because it's in your DNA. Your brother sent me hate mail after the last debate. You know, we're genetically different, right? We're not identical twins. We're, we're fraternal, so it's not in my DNA. It might be in my brother's. You might have a point there, but not mine. No, I will not send you angry emails or even really follow-up emails unless you need to follow up with me for something. And with that, if it's acceptable, Jefferson, if you'd give your closing thoughts. Sure. So, yeah, again, thanks, Richard, for having us on. Um, I know this isn't really your uh, your your thing. But I appreciate the time that you put into this and, and uh, uh, coordinating with between me and Gavin to get this all arranged. Gavin, thanks again for asking me to do this. I apologize if I'm a disappointing, uh, a disappointing uh, opponent, but you you did ask me. So, uh, but yeah, in closing, just that I there's a lot of really good um, scholarly literature out there about New Testament history, especially the history of the writings of the Gospels, the histories of the writings of of the Pauline epistles and the differences that have come up with them. And I think it's really important for uh, anybody who's interested in Bible studies or wants to get in discussions in sort of the great debate community when they're talking about uh, sort of the grounding for a belief in a Christian God, at least if they're trying to appeal to the Bible, 
understanding what it means, what the Bible actually says. And one of the things I frequently hear is what people will say, oh, um, well, Paul says this in Timothy. Paul said this in Titus. Paul said that in Colossians. You know, not, not to be too big of a pedant, but Paul probably didn't say that. I mean, those books say that. But it's, you know, trying to use a shorthand and saying, well, this is what Paul wanted. It's actually kind of inconsistent. And it's one of the reasons why there's a lot of women that think that Paul is this great big misogynist is because of what's written in First Timothy. Uh, if more of them knew that Paul probably didn't write that, they might not think he was that big of a misogynist anymore. So probably help his reputation a bit. But I think having a better understanding about where this stuff is, how it developed naturally, a real, a real comprehensive understanding of the early Christian church helps everybody if they're going to have debates about belief, non-belief, um, and, and how they're grounding this stuff and what their authorities are and all that. Um, and so I, I'm interested in it. I hope other people are too. And I hope some of the information that I've uh, brought to light in this um, makes at least maybe one person somewhat curious about it. But other than that, thanks again, guys. And with that, I yield my time. Thank you again. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. I think the debate went very well as, as far as you guys being considerate of each other. Uh, patience uh, appreciated uh, from Gavin and Jay that uh, Gavin had a pretty significant delay through the entire. And uh, even we had some people drop off accidentally a couple times there. But thank you all for attending. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for uh, proposing this, for trusting me and uh, allowing me to help you do this. And thanks to everyone who showed up to see a little bit of it, including, I think, four Jills now. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Say hello to, to my Atkins, Dan, Daniel Izbitsky, uh, Math Pig, uh, the Family B, and several others, Iron Charioteer, Chir Iron Charioteer and others. Thank you all so much. Uh, and with that, good night. Good night. God bless you.